we'll, we'll start this session. So thanks very much for joining uh, this session. We'll go through some introductions in a minute. Um, and there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of this session. So keep your eye on uh, putting some questions into the chat. So um, once again, welcome. Welcome to Cat Gemini's session on connected manufacturing. Um, I'm Susan Davis. I lead consumer products for supply chain uh, in Invent um, in the UK for Capgemini and I'm joined by three colleagues um, who each uh, play a very pivotal role in some of our connected manufacturing deployments around the world. So I'm delighted and I'm going to let them introduce in turn. So if I start with you, Eamon, if you could introduce. Yeah, Eamon Ben Said um, from uh, Invent France. Uh, I'm uh, specialised in operations transformations and mainly in manufacturing and supply chain. Thanks, Eamon. And Florent? Yeah, uh, Florent Pries. I have a background in uh, the oil and gas industry and have been working as a consultant in operations improvement and asset management improvements for the last 15 years. Thanks, Florent. And over to you, David. I'm David Rutter, solution architect with uh, Capgemini in the UK. I'm a, here as a smart factory SME with experience in cloud, IoT, big data, and I'll be talking about our experiences with a large FMCG client. Great. Thanks so much, David. Yeah, as each of our, uh, my colleagues have mentioned, we're going to dive into a specific example um, later on. Um, but let me first turn to the next page. And on the next page, really what we're outlining is the, the backdrop to the environment that we see for consumer product companies. And you may say that this is true for many of our, uh, our manufacturing clients uh, are seeing these types of um, uh, situations. So they have uh, strategic goals they're trying to meet. So they're trying to meet uh, very significant growth uh, through innovation and often hyper-personalization is an area for them. And they're growing really through um, these new channels. So lots of new channels are springing up and that was happening before COVID and that's been amplified now with COVID. So, um, and throughout all of that growth activity, they're also responding to that and trying to bring forward efficiency in their operations. So, um, and whilst doing efficiency, um, I think it's really obvious that um, no supply chain uh, is um, really um, uh, very well equipped to achieve the sustainability goals that uh, we're all trying to put in place at the moment. So those goals on the left uh, are being met by a lot of change, um, a lot of change in and how they're responding by increasing agility and responsiveness. Uh, to fill those new operating models, you know, the last mile, to look at the order quantities that need to come through and how they can deliver those using the assets that they currently have, recognising these assets to set up for scale. Um, and with personalisation, the need to put more efficiency into the operation is really paramount. And throughout that, how do they bring in technology, intelligence and automation? How do they bring forward insights? And the sustainability is really highlighting, you know, can they demonstrate the provenance, the traceability uh, that's necessary that consumers look for and sometimes regulatory authorities are looking for. So how do you put in place that visibility end to end across the network? Uh, and many people are moving away from calling it supply chain, looking at a value network, looking at something that's very you know, interconnected. Um, and that's that's become that's become the new sort of norm for for businesses as they look to respond to the growth and efficiency challenges. So um, if we look go to the next page, what we are also recognizing that there are some fundamental areas that people are looking at. So our clients are looking at uh, many areas. We've uh, summarized it as these these four key ones where uh, and we've read webinars on planning and control towers over the last uh, few weeks and if you need the links to those or you missed them please be in touch um, because they really illustrated you know the auto autonomous planning really just illustrated the opportunity to use um, continuous process cycles 
the right level of automation, the right level of touchless to be agile and responsive, and the control tower was providing visibility end to end and looking at the cost to serve with a lot of these globally scaled um, supply chains. But digging deep now into this session on uh, connected manufacturing, um, with colleagues really, we're going to look at um, you know, how to address something that might be a multi-speed supply chain. So it might have very different product types going through it now at very different scale and how to build those factories for the future to make sure they can monitor and do in-process um, controls, you know, update how they run to be able to drive performance and maintenance. And we often talk about that, and you'll see it coming through this um, webinar today, about something that's connected, intelligent, and moving towards uh, self-driving, moving towards, I, I must stress that. Um, so if we go to the, uh, the next page, what we're flagging here is those challenges for, uh, that we talked about in terms of the trends, they're really amplified when you get into the factory. So people are aiming to get to this um, factory of the future, but there's um, heaps of obstacles in the way, really. So they're trying to put more efficiency in for these different order types. They're trying to achieve, um, you know, much more personalization, um, you know, mass customization with an, with an asset set and a production line and packaging that's never been really uh, put in place to, um, to address that. Um, and bring new products quickly to market. So a lot of competition, uh, you know, there's been a lot of startups this year, you know, in this, in this really challenging um, sets of circumstances, you know, much more localization of supply chains. Um, and so how do people, how do people compete in that new world? Um, and whilst doing that, you know, the fifth bullet here, really looking at what that means for workers as well. Um, and what that means for security at all levels, um, cyber security, but also uh, personal security for workers. Um, and the last point, which Eamon will touch on a lot, you know, how do you really support and adopt that uh, with new ways of working for, uh, for colleagues? Um, how do you equip them to, um, to work with this, something that's connected and intelligent and, you know, and how do they change their own skill sets? Um, accordingly, so really heaps of uh, heaps of um, barriers and obstacles that that people are seeing as they um, as they go about, you know, achieving this uh, you know future factory. So what we are really observing, really on the on the next page, we're really highlighting from our research that very few of them are actually achieving their ambitions. So, um, you know, only 40% um, are satisfied, one four. <laughs> I think I may have said it so, so it came like 40%, but it's 14% satisfied with the level of connected manufacturing success. 60% um, are struggling and say it's a bit too early to comment, you know, even though we know, of course, that IoT and um, industrial IoT has been something, you know, you know within our grasp now for, for several years. Um, we're not really seeing the deployment levels coming through um, and we're not really, and, and lots of people are flagging that you know, these bar barriers are becoming a bit, have become um, things that have really held them back. So they might have made investments, but they're not getting the returns. So um, we're really sort of getting behind the, um, and under, under the skin of some of these, um, some of these issues and some of these blockers for, for clients and for businesses. So on the next page, what we're outlining here is, you know, a really diverse landscape of uh, ways that people are using data that might, exists in the IT and the OT layer and integrating that um, with MES, uh, ERP data, and there's a plethora of real um, examples that we've that we're illustrating here, where people are seeing seeing returns uh, on investment. Uh, many of you may have undertaken some of these, um, and it's really, as we'll outline as we go through this uh, webinar, these experimentations are happening. But how can you scale them? Because um, you know 
once you've done the experiment, you know, there's a lot of sunk cost in actually having done the experiment. And how do you reuse that and take it to many more factories, um, you know, reuse it across your across the landscape, um, you know, of your of your own manufacturing site. So there's a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunity here. Um, and if we go on, on to the next uh, page, what I'm highlighting here really is that there's a lot of data. I think we've all uh, probably experienced uh, some of these proof of concepts where you are really trying to tap into um, some of these data layers and integrate them. So we're solving challenges really by being able to um, use experience to really understand and, and platforms as David will outline to bring th those data sets together so that you can uh, deliver the value. And there's some examples of, of some of the results um, that, that we're, we're able to deliver um, here. So there's a lot of upside, but there's still a lot of um, a complex landscape, particularly in you know, manufacturing lines that for the global consumer product companies and life sciences companies that we're working with, um, even though they might be massive of scale, when you are working within a manufacturing environment, there are really disparate, really disparate systems and um, and, and aged age systems and um, and and therefore um, a real need for um, ability to be able to handle that level of complexity and those different and those different manufacturing lines. So um, we talk a lot about the technology and we talk a lot about the uh, the data and how we bring that all together. And on the next page, I think what I'm going to illustrate on the next page is much more around uh, what that really means for decision making. So we're talking here really on the left hand side about the situation. Uh, I try to make this look like it's sort of uh, much more black and white and get into the blue color when you're on the right hand side and you're in the connected manufacturing site. But at the moment, um, you know, we're seeing that sites um, historically are having ad hoc decision making. So they're operating a lot on their experience of running the sites and, and very little insights from this, from the data that they have available to them. A lot of, of sites are running on whiteboards, you know, um, at shift handovers and, you know, middle management are, are running the factory. And we're moving to a world which is going to be much more fact-based, uh, be able to simulate new product introduction, being able to have instrumented feedback, and therefore, we're moving to this new world where we're operating with insight. And that really means a shift in the, in the skills to be able to tune the systems that run the factory of the future and to really work a much more in a collaborative sense uh, with colleagues inside and outside uh, of the four walls of the factory. So it's a real big shift that's, that's really underway. And that under, is underpinned by the title really here saying, you know, the connected factory is also driving this cultural, uh, this cultural transformation. And that's really going to be key for us um, at, when we're engaging with um, some of the uh, global clients that we're working with to address that cultural transformation. Um, and then page turning to the next, what we're seeing is navigating through that is really critical. So you can see on the axes, the probably perhaps familiar now um, uh, axes of descriptive, predictive and prescriptive. And how does that really play out in the connected manufacturing world as you're really moving from, um, you know, perhaps raw data, data that you can't understand, data that's very disparate. You know, how do you work with process expertise? Um, how do you actually move? Uh, move the needle when it comes to the analytics that you can deploy and what type of validation are you therefore able to use as you navigate your way through this sort of hierarchy really and and what I'm just flagging on the right hand side is you know the type of insights that are delivered um, and what's um, it, what's al we're also seeing is that you know initially on this sort of first layer things are very site centric and then people are looking at best practices and then into more into the operating model as people are looking at what the impact is when they're deploying this across multiple sites. So this could be, you know, um, 
tens, even hundreds of sites, what, what can be the skills that um, leaders of, of these manufacturing units can, um, can bring in, in the future? You know, we've worked with clients who have been trying to deploy operational excellence and lean processes you know, across multiple sites. And, and it's um, and it's uh, it's the, it's really hard to try and navigate that, uh, and you overlay that now with this new opportunity really to sort of tap into knowledge, process expertise, and the data and analytics, and bring to life a new level of value to be able to achieve the growth and the efficiency and the sustainability that we touched on right at the start of this segment on this webinar where we were outlining these are the challenges and navigating your way through the data, the process expertise, analytics um, and the operational validation is all part of you know, um, being successful in the, connect in the connected factory. So we're going to uh, step now into um, what that really means uh, the real world, you know. So this is the this is sort of the, the method and the framework that that we're able to bring to bear. Um, and on the next page, I'm really just highlighting um, here um, what the what our three case studies are going to cover. So um, this is uh, let me set the scene before I hand it over to Eamon. So if I um, we're going to start with Eamon and we're going to work our way through left to right. Um, and I've picked these examples really deliberately based on what we were saying it makes for success in the connected factory. So what's really making for success is being human centric, recognising that it really is important to understand what the new ways of working are going to be with digital and how to bake those into the flow. Um, and we're going to... Uh, you know, the day in the life, the personas and how um, how to bring that to life to deliver business results. Um, uh, our colleague Florin is going to talk through an analytics example uh, with a, uh, an FMCG client, uh, looking there to um, really land concepts and looking at particular assets um, and being able to find how to use those outputs and deploy them um, within, a, within a site. And then David, um, who you met at the start of the webinar, is going to talk through how to develop a platform and what that really means to allow scale, uh, because many businesses can try and achieve uh, local and single success. How do you make a, a maximum a reuse of that and how do you use a platform to enable you to achieve the repeatability that's critical? So um, I'm now going to hand across to Eamon, who's going to talk through our first example, but feel free to post questions um, as we go through this. Thanks very much. Over to you, Eamon. Thank you, Susan. So uh, for, for the example, and we have, we, I'll try to illustrate uh, the, the human-centric part, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so. The, the customized manufacturing um, drugs, especially we are at the first steps of uh, formulation. The manufacturing of the product can last more than 40 hours, experience multiple shift changing and handover. And to smooth this manufacturing and to be uh, more performance, operators and line managers need to quickly access to the status of their line, their machines. Uh, if a problem such as lower pressure, higher temperature, slowing down in the cycle, how can I uh, quickly detect it and how can I quickly act on it? The shop floor supervision uh, aims to provide at a glance in a real time the status of all the manufacturing lines and machines. The status, the product they are uh, handling and uh, what are the expecting end of manufacturing um, and the human centricity in the projects comes in two steps and we will illustrate one of those uh, two steps. The first one is what is the best user experience I have to monitor all my machines and all my lines at a glance in real time and help me also track the deviations. And the other one, I, as I have a digital tool, what are the best user journey 
but the experience I have to fulfill my operational performance. So, uh, in in fact, for the, this project, we we uh, we aims and we uh, at least identified um, real savings uh, to make operational benefits in terms of. Uh, uh, cycle time reduction, we are uh, about 20 to 25 percent cycle time reduction in that case. And the digital solution we were proposing is will help and support the line managers and the operators to activate the four main levers, the reduction of production slot losses, the optimization of standard cycle times, the real-time monitoring and delays detection, and the schedule adherence. So the, the project is also used as a uh, as a showroom as an example, and we have other entities that are interested to deploy the solution, and we built a platform that is ready to scale. To illustrate, so we can move to the next slide. I will try to uh, to illustrate some of the human centricity uh, through this user journey. So I take some screenshots of the of the solutions. So the user journey is a cycle from detecting the deviations or delays, and we are acting and correcting them, tracking the root causes, and uh, take also we need to take a time to step back, analyze in deep those root causes into problem solving sessions, implement the solutions, and or update some manufacturing parameters or or manufacturing receipts. And at the end of the day, tracking all the benefits that we have uh, from, from that journey. So if we can move to the next one. In summary, what makes uh, the project uh, such a success? Um, in fact, the human centricity is key. And uh, we illustrated them with uh, adopting a design thinking approach to build the user journey and the user experience. And we uh, developed several workshops with the users with some mockups, how you would like to see it, what are the, the best experience you, you will have. And we, we spent a lot of time in that part. And also, uh, to make it also a success, we need, this is, is the front end, the user experience and the user journey is the front end of the, of the, of the solution, but you need to rely on a, on a back end that is a, an interoperable platform that can handle all the data of your connected manufacturing, that, that tackling all the data that you have from your systems, ERPs or MES or, or automatic machines. And also we developed to make it ready for scale for other entities or a set of library of features that we can reuse and uh, be ready for scale. So I uh, the floor to my colleague. Thanks, Eamon. That, that's really helpful because I think that really illustrates how you almost start the cultural change as well. Um, and now I think we're going to hear from from Flora about you know a particular use case that he's been working on. So thanks, Eamon. Over to you, Florin. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to take as an example is a uh, a large dairy product manufacturer uh, that operates on a worldwide scale, and uh, we are supporting their in-house corporate data science team uh, with a dedicated skill pool from Capgemini of data scientists, engineers, front-end developers, and uh, people like me, uh, which is dubbed a data strategist. And uh, in these next eight minutes, I'm going to uh, share with you some lessons learned, which are very much non-technical. And, uh, and, and this is also a bit of uh, how, we, how we look at this. Uh, we have the technology and we can offer it at, 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 the, at an affordable price. What is the trick is actually to make it work. And so there are th three things that I want to tackle with you. Uh, one is what do you need in terms of foundation and trust to make this work? And uh, how do you integrate this in a, a current non-flexible environment and how to scale this? And uh, to start with the trusted foundation is that you actually uh, do not start with adding new smartness, 
but you reproduce what they already know, but in a far more data-driven uh, manner. So um, if shift reporting is done based on OEE, you will re reproduce OEE and, 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 and RAM recipes and uh, downtime reporting, but purely on machine data and start feeding that into the operational organization and thereby creating uh, the trust and understanding that we are looking at the same thing, but only in a more objective manner. And uh, that, that is a starting point. And then there's some other things that are key to keep the trust and understanding. And that is, uh, if you're not careful, uh, making use of more data also brings more variation. And um, and you, uh, which only brings more options, more confusion, and uh, harder to train people to actually act upon this data. Also, uh, you don't want to try to be right. You want, if you try to be right, that uh, that also means the option that you're wrong. And you don't want to be wrong too many times. Uh, people are forgiven for for making uh, uh, false remarks. Systems are not very much. So you want. To, you, your output not to have too many fla flavors. If it's indicative of place, the kind of problem, and it it's, supplies you with a starting point for human human action, that's good enough. So it be indicative. And uh, and then the last one, uh, don't make your systems or your algorithm or your uh, user interface look smart. Make people look smart. So give them tools to do what they do better today, which is already within their scope of responsibilities. And how to do this? Uh, well, one is reproduce what they already know. Second is, and then I'll go for the next slide. Yeah, is integrated in their current work current workflow and make it work within the existing data landscape. So uh, if we look at this picture, this is uh, in, uh, an indication for how you could organize uh, predictive maintenance. Um, so you make use of all the data that's already there and you use the smart analytics to improve how this data works together. And uh, then we also come to the, to the third topic, which I want to tackle is uh, scale use the trick here is to do your uh, your inquisitive trials in a uh, uh, isolated data rich environment and take from there what we call portable smartness because uh, especially in in this uh, uh, manufacturing uh, companies you have a scattered landscape both in locations but also in variety of systems so you want to take out portable smartness that uh, you can use in a uh, less data rich environment than where you actually created the insights. So you want to take models and algorithms from your trials that uh, work in a landscape of existing data. And then uh, during the scaling, there's uh, you need patience. Where you where you created your insights, that was an isolated environment where you were probably on site, spent a lot of time, uh, became familiar with the people. And if you now throw the, the models and smartness and new measures and parameters to a new location and don't spend that time there, uh, uh, it will not be accepted or integrated in the workflows. And uh, so scaling will fail. Um, this is what I briefly wanted to share with you. And the main message is, and then I go to the next one. Um, do it both. It is, is uh, start building uh, the landscape on a corporate scale. And at the same time, make sure that uh, your change is uh, based on location, on solving the problems that you actually, actually have and uh, and you prioritize based on uh, what is what they consider as being daily problems in operating the plant, uh, uh, maintaining quality, or managing the asset. And uh, you select those use cases either 
being very scalable on the existing architecture. I think I explained that a bit already. And uh, you also select uh, volatile components with high criticality um, to actually uh, invest in adding more, more data or analytics. Uh, I see Susan coming in, so I think I'm uh, <laughs> running out of time. Um, core message, we have the technology or the technology is available. That's actually a bit better. And uh, uh, invest in how to make it scalable and uh, make sure that you choose a appropriate ambition level. I wasn't trying to hurry you along though, Florin. I was not trying to hurry <laughs> you along because I really, um, it strikes me a lot. You know, we talked about uh, this example and, uh, you know, and, and using analytics and it strikes me a lot how, you know, that could be a very sort of really deep into data scientist world of analytics. And what you really illustrated here is how nicely that ties back to the user centric journey um, and really bringing people along with you. So I love the idea that making people look smart because people are smart and it's giving them the sort of tools and it's giving them the uh, the insights that they need to be able to do, you know, to 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 do their best really with the uh, with the assets and in the environment. So that's that's fantastic, and it's a brilliant bridge to David. And so, because what we're hoping now is that David's going to be able to tell us how he puts all the infrastructure underneath all those. So thanks very much, Florin. And I wasn't trying to hurry you, but that's it was right, really and, uh, helpful. And, uh, and I, I, I know David will, because uh, uh, most of my thinking is based on this free work uh, that, that he did a few years ago. Yeah, thanks so much, Florin. Yeah, I'm handing across to you, David, and, and we've got all our hopes on you that you're going to have all the technology underneath this to catch all this data that we're producing and all these analytics as well. Thanks, Susan. So if we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Now, thanks for those kind of words, Florin. And, and it's really striking how these three examples um, pull together. Uh, before I deep dive into what we did with our client, I wanted to say a few words about the drivers. So on this slide, you see some typical drivers that were selected by Morgan Stanley. And what you see here is lots of things to do with efficiencies. There's one thing on cost, there's another on opportunities. But really, the drivers here are about efficiencies and, and money and really misses the point, if I'm being honest. So when we talk to our clients, their drivers are much more about how can we do this the same across our, all our factories? How do we get the data out of the factory? How do we uh, democratize the data and sometimes that is about putting power in the hands of the your employees and sometimes it's because your employees are leaving as in they get you've got an aging pop we've got an aging population an aging workforce and the knowledge that those people have about your factories um, is leaving as they as they retire and, and then finally, one that has come up on our radars much more recently is maybe you're on SAP R3 and you need to upgrade to S4. And a lot of companies on their R3 have put their business logic hard coded in, into R3 and it's very difficult to transition that in, into S4. And that's another place where um, industrial IoT can, can, play, uh, can play a role. So if we go on to the next slide, what we'll see is the key driver for my client was their lean processes for optimizing their factory. So they, they have a set of processes, they want to take in the real-time information on the left, bring in safety, um, quality, and create a set of applications that they can use within their control towers but not just for one factory, but across the globe. Um, to enhance that information, we bring in the energy and the water management. And now we're currently looking at how we can use video processing, so AI, to enhance the information about why we have stoppages, and what the quality of the products is that we're producing, and 
in the future, the roadmap is to move into prescriptive maintenance. Um, so the starting point of a lot of these projects is a point proof of concept. So on the, on the next slide, what you see is something that we, we come across several times <clears throat> where people try and get data out of the factory and into the cloud and say, right, I've got a POC. But it really, really doesn't work because you've got to look at why are you trying to do this and how are you going to make it work and scale? Um, so rather than a POC, what we did with our client was we gave them a platform. So on the next slide, what you'll see is we take the data from the factory, bottom left, ingest that data, process it according to whether we, we need the information instantly on the screen or whether we're doing analysis on it. And we create a set of lean applications on the platform. We also, excuse me, allow the employees to do self-service so they can build their own Power BI reports on the data, they can create their own applications using load code technologies. And then in addition to the factory, we then pull in the enterprise systems data, so that will have all of the planning in it. We bring in the factory systems data, so we know what information is in the warehouse. We can order um, goods, uh, sorry, order the raw materials um, onto the line. And then another key part of this engagement was to bring in the social media and the customer engagement, because ultimately that has a host of demand and quality information that we can then use to drive real innovation in the, in the products. So for this client, we built them an intelligent operations platform. This is a, an offering that we have to, jointly with Microsoft on the Azure platform that we can roll out and accelerate the delivery for other clients like yourselves. And if we go on to the next slide, this is showing how we do it with for, for one factory. We use the power of the Azure uh, network to deploy this across many factories worldwide. The connectivity that you've just seen is currently in 30 factories and some of the um, other applications that don't need in-depth connectivity, um, some of those have been deployed um, in up to 300 uh, factories. So what we're talk talking about is providing platforms, building the applications that meet the, the, the need and the, and the drivers, and scaling that on a really worldwide scale. So the, so the key takeaways, platform-based development, um, converging these key technologies for what you've seen is the OT data with the IT world, um, using IoT with cloud-based technologies, big data, democratization. Underpinning that is good architecture governance with the data management, data models, and APIs so that people can do the self-service. And the final kicker is a really nice quote from the CIO of the, of the company saying that the use of platforms has allowed them to be much more agile and much more scalable. And without the platforms, they really can't deliver. And they really are exploiting um, these platforms to, to a really great extent. Um, and it's really impacting their bottom line. So thank you very much for that. And back over to Susan. Thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, so on the next slide, I'm really going to sort of summarise some of the um, key points that have come up. And the, they're the things that we really find uh, are unlocking the, uh, you know, un the, the barriers, but delivering the value as well. So, um, and while I'm doing that, I know that some of you've been posting uh, questions in the in the chat room. So we will get onto that. In the, in the next sort of five minutes. So feel free to, to add, add to that list. Um, so in, in summary, uh, and there's, there's so many lessons learned and, and we've got pages and pages of, of things that, you know, that we've been finding and, you know, 
we've re really been developing accelerators that have really helped us. So Amen was really talking through the user centricity, how to also put innovation into this into individual sites because this is around um, bringing people and allowing people to to deliver and make decisions at site level but also to be able to share share that and be able to scale that out across multiple sites um, we then moved into analytics so tangible benefits quickly and providing um, you know a, a list of use cases that can really deliver um, deliver to the bottom line and um, the third one we really touched on with David which was how to pull together an ecosystem of technology sets um, to deliver in a repeatable way across multiple multiple sites you know tens of factories globally uh, and the last one really here is you know the combination of really of all of these um, areas really brings you to what is the new operating model uh, for the future for sites? Uh, what should happen above site, in the site? How do people share best practices? How do you support with controls? Um, and how do you recognize that for many companies, the manufacturing that they're using is not just internal, but it's also uh, a landscape that involves co-manufacturers, co-packers. -pack, so it's a really, uh, really diverse landscape. So